Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Jose Francisco, project manager at the IAS USA. Today's webinar will be going over the part three of the four part IAS USA webinar series on pain and addiction. And this webinar will be presented by Dr. Bruce, who is from Boston University School of Medicine. Welcome, Dr. Bruce. Thank you very much. Jose, I don't know if you want me to start my video or not, or just go with the slides here. Ooh. Let me start your video now, Dr. Bruce. Awesome. Hit the button. Fantastic. Well, welcome everyone this afternoon to what's going to be an exciting discussion of uh, HIV, opioid use, hepatitis C, and the goal of this obviously is to cover some really important information and have a good conversation about it. Uh, we have some basic information here at the beginning for CME, so please take a note. This designates this live activity for a maximum of 1.2 AMA category one credits. And you can see all of the various ways in which this has been approved, CME, ABIM, MOC points, nursing, hours of pharmacotherapy credit and pharmacy hours. And in bold there at the bottom, instructions for claiming credit will be emailed out to everybody. As you can see, this is this activity is supported by generous sponsors. You can see the platinum and silver sponsors listed. So some of the things we'll be doing today are interactive. So please take note, there'll be some poll questions. Uh, the window will show up separately, choose your response and then we'll take a look at what people are thinking. Also important is this is an interactive conversation. If you've got questions, please submit questions using the Q&A button, uh, which is gonna be a really important uh, function for you. Your first and last name needs to be indicated in order to have the conversation or the question addressed generally. And um, obviously most questions will be answered hopefully throughout the context of the webinar and apologies in advance if we're not able to get to every question through the, the entire process. All right, so we're gonna start out with a general question and this is from what geographic region are you viewing this webinar? So, or is it the South or Southeast US, the Northeast US, Canada, Mexico, Central South America, Europe, Asia, or Australia? Right. We'll see the results. So most uh, folks here, a little bit more, almost half from the Northeast US, uh, but as you can see, we have some individuals from uh, all over the world. So welcome everyone. So our second question is please rate your experience, your level of experience in the medical management of HIV infection with one being novice and five being expert. All right, we'll see what everyone says. All right, like in lots of tests, right? It's the middle of the bell curve, answer C. Number three, uh, was favored by 32%, but we have some people beginning out in their HIV career who consider themselves as novice. And then we have a fair number of more experienced providers. Thank you. All right, let's get into the meat here. Um, this is gonna be important. We're gonna do two pre-test questions and then we're gonna get into the meat of the conversation and hopefully learn in the process. So first, which medication or medications has the best retention and treatment for people with an opioid use disorder. Buprenorphine, methadone, naltrexone, A and C, B and C, or F, they're all the same with regard to retention. Retention is the most important word there. All right. Okay, so Buprenorphine edged out methadone a little bit. Uh, we had some hedging bets and voting with the AC or BC and a fair number 14% saying that really they're all the same. Well, one of the things that we're gonna learn in the course of this conversation, the 
true answer is actually B, methadone has better retention than the other forms of treatment that has to do with the properties of methadone, which we'll get to in a little bit. All right. And then our next pretest question, how long should a person with opioid use disorder be sober prior to starting hepatitis C treatment? Zero, three, six, nine, or 12 months. All right. And what do we see? Fantastic. Most individuals said zero months, and that's absolutely right. If someone is ready to get hepatitis C treatment, able to take the medications, they should be offered treatment at any point in the recovery process, even if that is at zero months. Excellent. All right. So today we're going to describe the basic methods. Oops. We're going to describe the basic methods of screening for uh, and caring for people who, uh, with HIV who have an opioid use disorder. We're going to talk about our treatment for opioid use disorders and implementing the basic principles of treating HIV and hepatitis C in that context. All right. So in 2017, it's, it always continues to amaze me, there's an estimated 271 million people, that's 5.5% of the global population, uh, use drugs in the last year. And just to wrap our minds around, I mean, that's an astronomical number. Drug addiction is something that is plaguing the entire world. And about 53 million people worldwide who are using opioids. Um, and, you know, just to put that into context for the Northeast, right, this is several, several New York cities uh, of just individuals using opioids. And one of the things uh, among those around 29 people who use opiates, uh, there are really estimates that uh, this number is probably a little bit low. Opioids continue to cause huge amounts of harm. And as we all know, in the middle of an opioid epidemic, it's contributing significantly to death. We used to say injection drug users, but now we say people who inject drugs uh, with our per people first language. And there are some 11 million people worldwide in 2017 who were injecting some form of drugs. People inject opioids, but they also inject amphetamines uh, and other medications. Uh, some people inject very interesting substances, had some patients once who were injecting Seroquel. Uh, more than half of people uh, who are injecting likely have hepatitis C and approximately one in eight live with HIV. You can see there the global burden of disease study in 2017 estimated that in, in 2017 there were over a half a million deaths, about 42 million years of healthy life lost as a result of substance use. Around half of the drug-related deaths were attributed to untreated hepatitis C, and that's because in most parts of the world, hepatitis C still remains untreated, and people, whether it's co-infection with HIV or ongoing alcohol use disorder, have accelerated progression, and once developing cirrhosis, have limited options post that. For people with other drug use disorders, the availability of an access to treatment remains very limited. It's just staggering that here in 2020, only one in seven people with drug use disorders will receive treatment in a year. I think this is really important to remember because oftentimes substance users are blamed for not getting sober. And this is a huge issue. And this is obviously a misguided approach. Many people, even those who want to get treatment, just simply don't have access to it. Uh, anecdotally, is that just by way of mentioning when the Scott County, Indiana, outbreak occurred among, with HIV among people who inject drugs. One of the things that shocked me the most was the lack of treatment available to injectors in that area. I received a call to try and help sort out treatment options. And initially, actually, the, normally I, I'm doing things internationally and I was trying to figure out what country so I could figure out the legal ramifications of getting treatment. And I was really surprised that you know, here I was thinking that we were talking about a foreign country and we were talking about a county in Indiana that just really didn't have access to treatment. It's something that we all need to really realize. Many people want treatment, but not everyone has access. So I'm sure many of us have faced this kind of issue. Why is this refill taking so long? You inherit a new patient, Bob. He's a 45 year old gentleman. He comes in for his refill of oxycodone. It's 30 milligram tablets, two tablets every six hours total of 240 tablets for the month. 
Uh, you notice there hasn't been a urine toxicology in five years, uh, but there have been a few recent emergency department visits for methamphetamine intoxication. Today, Bob is agitated, struggling to sit still and wondering why the refill takes so long. What is your step? What do you wanna do? You can curse the provider who left you a mess, give the refill and find a way never to see the patient again, call social work or anyone to try and diffuse the situation and get the patient into treatment. You could talk with the patient about the ED visit and the methamphetamine use to gauge interest in treatment and refill the medication, or you could do number four and not refill the medication. So tell us what you would like to do. It's like one of those adventure books when we were kids. All right. So uh, one honest person admitted that he or she would curse the provider who left GMS. I think probably all of us might have wanted to, to certainly fill that out. A uh, fair number of people, actually more than half, suggested that they would go ahead and talk to the patient about methamphetamine use and gauge interest in treatment. Um, some thought they would do that as well, an additional seven people, but not refill the medication. Now, something that I didn't uh, comment on, and we can move on to the next slide here, um, but is we don't know what the person had in his urine at this time. So let's say that the person in the emergency room got a urine toxicology and that urine toxicology showed that the patient had oxycodone in his urine. Well, that would certainly influence my behavior because I would think, okay, he's continuing to take the oxycodone. He has a real pain disorder, but in addition, he has a methamphetamine disorder. And in that situation, I would definitely want to confront the patient about methamphetamine, but I'd also want to refill the oxycodone. Now, I might refill it for a shorter period of time. I might refill it and link that patient to substance use treatment for the methamphetamine use. But given that he also is using oxycodone and is physically dependent upon it, to then withhold that would cause precipitated withdrawal at some point. Withdrawal symptoms obviously could potentially lead the individual to increase substance use and risky behavior. But if that urine toxicology came back with no oxycodone in it, just methamphetamines, then that actually might tip my hand the other way and think, okay, this person is getting oxycodone, is not taking it, but potentially using the oxycodone as a way to fund the methamphetamine habit. Usually most patients are taking some amount of the oxycodone, selling some of it and using it as a means to fund their drug use. That's the middle of the bell curve. That's not all patients, certainly. Um, Obviously one of the important things when thinking in a harm reduction pathway here is when the urine drug test does not match what's prescribed, we have to consider several things. One is, did the patient run out of the pain medication early because they were in more pain? Well, understanding the historical urine toxicologies, the understanding the history of the patient, what the pain disorder is and things going on like that, you, have, you could have a nice sense of, okay, this really makes good sense, right? Um, it could be a false positive or a false negative. And as I mentioned, it could be diversion. One of the most important things in any urine drug toxicology is to know what your test can and cannot do, right? The, the most famous examples of these is all of the individuals who thought that oxycodone showed up as an opiate in urine toxicology. It doesn't unless you've taken lots and lots of oxycodone. So make sure that you talk with your lab and know what your uh, urine toxicology shows. A little bit more about uh, substance use and harm reduction. All right, so one of the really important things when people have problematic behavior in clinic, right, is, is the pain not being treated? Are there poor coping spills, skills, excuse me, is it a relapse to drug use? This is important because, you know, when people come in and they're acting out in clinic, the assumption tends to be active drug use, bad actor. And sometimes it's, you know, bad doctor, you know, we didn't treat the pain adequately. That always needs to be forefront in the mind are we treating the person's underlying condition, whether that's pain, whether that's substance use. All right, so we're gonna talk about the neurobiology of addiction and its implications for care. This is really important because when you understand the underlying drives, you have a better sense of why people do what they do and why and how we can intervene and help facilitate treatment. It's always important to remember that both HIV and hepatitis C are proxies for risk-taking. And what I mean by that is that people who take greater risks wind up with HIV and hep C, right? So 
uh, someone may not be willing to engage in injection after someone else or not have you know cleaned their works or of uh, you know any number of things actually and you have to remember that means a person takes more risks so it wouldn't surprise you hopefully that someone with hiv and a substance use disorder who's an injector isn't going to wear a seatbelt isn't going to wear a helmet on a motorcycle is going to smoke lots of cigarettes drink alcohol may or may not take their hiv therapy those are just other risk-taking behaviors so our response to those things shouldn't be shame and condemnation. It should be, okay, this makes sense. This person was willing to take greater risks than the average population. So they're not just taking risks relative to injecting, they're taking risks throughout their lives. And that's important for you to have an honest conversation with people about what they're doing with their medications. So when we say addiction, what do we mean? So addiction has two main components that are really important. Okay, individuals are engaging in a compulsive behavior, but that behavior is reinforcing, it's pleasurable, right? People aren't addicted to homework, homework's not pleasurable, right? It's something that's neurobiologically rewarding, right? So this is like food, we love food, it makes us feel good, it's like sex. There, I assume most people like sex. There's a loss of control in limiting the intake of the substance, right? So when we say to a substance user, oh, just stop, we've missed the boat. Right. The reality is, if they could stop, that they would, right? By definition, someone who is addicted to the substance has lost control. Why do people take substances? Obviously, there's a group that are doing it to have these novel feelings. A lot of my patients historically are really doing it to feel better, to lessen anxiety, to lessen worries and fears, depression, hopelessness. So this is a huge issue. A large number of the people that we take care of are victims of violence of some kind. Uh, whether it's childhood or as an adult. And people find that opioids in particular, but many drugs numb the brain. They just help people forget. And often that's what people want is to forget. But not everyone that takes a substance, right, is going to become addicted to that substance. And so this is really important for us to stand. Why do some people become addicted and others don't? And everything in science really falls on this continuum. This continuum was first proposed by uh, Brown and Goldstein, who discovered LDL and got the Nobel Prize for it. And their argument was really diseases fall on this continuum. Some are more biologic or genetic and some are more related to the environment. But everything's on the continuum. And I think a really good example is Down syndrome. Down syndrome is trisomy 21. So you have an extra chromosome 21. And you might think that it's purely a genetic disorder, but it's not because we know environmentally maternal age, right? The older the mother, the higher the probability of trisomy 21 or Down syndrome. So even this situation, there's this coupling of environment with genetics. And the same is true of our patients who have substance use disorders. There is a genetic predisposition, but there are lots of environmental triggers that can result in people using substances and becoming addicted. Here's an example from a very famous study from several decades ago, actually the last century. And it's looking at dopamine receptors and the response to a challenge of methylphenidate. Methylphenidate is Ritalin and it's gonna increase dopamine in the brain. And so what you're going to see in here is that in the top uh, PET scan here, the high dopamine receptor activity, you're going to have, um, with the, this is at baseline, right? This is not with methylphenidate. So that's important to know. These are just normal subjects, no prior history of substance use disorders, probably a bunch of med students who got paid to do this. And this is their brains with no methylphenidate. So you've got some people that are just naturally have a higher concentration of dopamine and you have another group that has lower amount. And so it might seem intuitive, but it's really important to just emphasize that there's a whole group of people Right? And this group of people have lower amounts of dopamine. Right, They're in this group. This group takes methylphenidate and they find it pleasurable. Those individuals up here with already enough uh, dopamine in the brain don't find methylphenidate pleasurable. And this is actually something that we see practically in people who use cocaine, for example. They will uh, have intense cocaine cravings, their dopamine's low, they'll take a bunch of cocaine, and at some point they'll kind of, uh, Overdose is the wrong word, but they all just have reached a moment of too much cocaine in this binge and then they got to stop, right? They just, they've got tilt written on their forehead and they're done. 
And so what we find is that actually too much dopamine is dysphoric, it's not pleasurable. And so this is one of the things that's really important to remember. These are individuals who genetically are predisposed because they have differences in dopamine concentration. Based on the difference in their biology, they have a subjective different response to the same dose of methylphenidate. Some like it and some don't. And this is one of those reasons why people say don't ever try drugs because we don't always know what our biology is. This is also the reason that drug dealers tend to target adolescents. Adolescents tend not to be thinking in the long term, always feel invincible and are willing to try new things. And so if you're really trying to find who are the people that are hardwired to become the next generation of drug users, what drug dealers do is they get up uh, drugs to as many people at the earliest stage possible. So what are these, some of these circuits? Well, this nucleus accumbens, the NAC here, that was what was lighting up on the prior PET scan, right? And this is really involved, importantly, in reward. Reward meaning your brain telling it, that was great, let's do that again. And it's not surprising that that little area is actually hardwired into the hippocampus, which is memory, amygdala, which is your emotion. And then the wiring over here to motivation and drive, and, and then up here into the prefrontal cortex, which is inhibitory control. And teenagers don't have a lot of inhibitory control, which is another reason, again, drug dealers like to give uh, or try and hook people at a young age because they don't have inhibitory control, they think they're invincible, and they're willing to take the substances. Because all of these are hardwired in, it's not surprising that if you have bad memories or trauma or other things or emotional distress, people look to feel better and wiring into the nucleus accumbens, that pleasure response will help calm down these other systems and will make you feel better. So we know that biology is important, but environment is super important as well. And what are some of the environmental things that contribute to addiction? Well, we know that stress does, right? Stress is a key reason for relapse. So the patients that you see in clinic, if you find out that your patient's been evicted or that your patient's partner uh, broke up or left or passed away or overdosed, any kind of psychosocial stress is gonna increase the probability someone will relapse, right? Why? Because as we mentioned earlier, if substances have become a coping mechanism, a way to feel better, when you're stressed, you're gonna to go to that way to feel better, right? And that's really important. So, you know, when people are starting HIV therapy or hep C treatment, you know, one of the things that becomes important in talking to patients is really on what are kind of the stresses that are going on in your life and how do we address that stress? Because if people are really stressed out, they're gonna have a high probability, not absolute, but a high probability of returning to drug use. Obviously early physical or sexual abuse is very traumatizing and can really leave uh, scars that people will want to then uh, cover up with substances. Remember that witnessing violence, so PTSD takes many forms and you don't actually even have to have been the person who is trauma, like physically violated in order if you watched it to become traumatized by that. Um, peers who use drug can obviously influence you and then availability, right? There are just some places where it's so easy to get substances and people are pushing substances off on you. I find this is a very interesting experiment. This is from this century. Um, and this is looking at some uh, macaques and what's, what's going on in, in these animals is they are both housed and then they are isolated. And so when you see some animals that are individually housed, you're kind of king of your own mountain, right? And that's to the far left. When you are then put into a group, well, some, you know, not everybody can be king, right? So some are going to become more dominant. Those who are dominant are getting their own internal pleasure response as a result of that. They're getting a little dopamine hit, right? Power is a trip. But then they're gonna be those individuals who are subordinate and the subordinate animals, they're not getting that hit. They're not getting that dopamine. And what do they do? We see on the far right, those subordinate ones, they're gonna do more cocaine, right? They're, they're gonna do more cocaine. The dominant ones don't need to do cocaine, right? Because like, I'm getting my high off of being in control. So again, this is just an, another way to look biologically at what's happening in the mind uh, as a result of social stress. You know, it's interesting when we think about substance use and mental illness co-occurring, and there's been a lot looked at in the last 20 years on co-occurring disorders, but it's really important not to miss out on the 
just real reality that in our patients who are taking risk or getting HIV and hepatitis C, that substance use is also intermingled in complex ways with mental illness. And so uh, why does that happen? Well, you know, once sometimes, and, and I've seen this a fair amount, is the self-medication hypothesis where using a substance helps alleviate symptoms of mental illness. And this is something that we've been talking about for the last several slides about how substance use such as in trauma or mental illness like trauma can cause these intense negative feelings and drugs can make the person feel better, right? Think back to years ago when we were starting a young woman on treatment for opioid use disorder. And one of the things I typically ask patients is, you know, when did you start using? What was going on around there? And she just said to me, well, you know, I started using when I was 17. I started using because I wanted to forget. Now, I didn't explore more at that point because I was very concerned that somebody who uses that kind of language, something very traumatic had happened at the age of 17 and that this young woman was quickly using opioids as a way to mask that, right? And, you know, she met with a therapist and as time went on, it became apparent that what had happened when she was 17 was that she was sexually assaulted. And that's what had led in many ways to the use of opioids because opioids for her meant a way to deal with and address the internal pain that she was feeling as a result of the trauma. So we have to be very careful. And this is why it's very dangerous when we just tell patients to stop using drugs. If that drug use is their coping mechanism, right? What are you doing? You're saying, go out and experience horrible pain, but we're not gonna help you deal with the pain. We have to have structures in place to help people who in using opioids or other substances to basically treat their mental illness, that as we work to help take away those drugs of abuse, right? We have to have treatment for the underlying mental illness or the patient cannot be successful. Um, there are causal effects. Well, we've had some patients who were using substances recreationally or otherwise, and then mental illness occurred. So I can think of the K2 epidemics, the synthetic cannabinoids that can cause psychotic breaks or the mixtures of stimulants like methamphetamine, cocaine, uh, and opioids where people can get psychotic from those stimulants or any number of things. Sometimes people will get victimized, physical or sexual violence while intoxicated. Um, and then obviously there are these uh, correlated causes. So some um, risk factors give rise to mental illness and substance use that can overlap. So for example, as we're talking about, uh, there are mental health disorders that are genetically predisposed like bipolar disorder, which can lead to high risk behaviors uh, such as substance use. So this is just a great reminder that as we look at uh, this MRI, right, you're looking at the prefrontal cortex. And, and what this is wanting to show you is that the prefrontal cortex, which is that inhibitory control that we talked about several slides ago, that's the part of the brain that is really in charge of inhibitory control. And so teenagers don't really have it. Substance users who start using as adolescents often that part of the brain gets negatively influenced, right? So you don't have to learn inhibitory control if you basically become a drug user. And so stop trying to inhibit oneself, right? Why is that really important? Because inhibitory control is tied to delayed gratification. Delayed gratification is important, but sometimes patients who are taking their medications regularly are having to delay gratification. Oh, I'm not going to do this, or I'm, I'm not gonna do that, I need, I need to take my medicine. So it's really important to remember that our patients who are substance users are gonna struggle with concepts of delayed gratification. They want what they want when they want it, which also is one reason why uh, clinic systems that have that in mind, that is the person's ready, be ready when they're ready, like that kind of setup, which is low threshold, is really important to really capturing people. Right? If you, the patient comes in and wants treatment or is interested in hep C treatment or HIV treatment or drug treatment, and you say, ah, you know, it's Wednesday and the next intake is next Tuesday afternoon. Why don't you come back then? You've lost the patient because it's improbable that they're going to come back. Because if, if they could take care of themselves and if they could solve all their problems over the next week without you, then they really don't have a serious drug problem. Another thing that's important when thinking about our patients and the way in which they're processing information uh, as adults are often using their frontal cortex and teens and then those individuals who've been using substances and haven't had to learn how to use the frontal cortex are really driven 
predominantly emotionally. And so they're really thinking more with their amygdala. They're thinking with their emotions. And this is really, really important because oftentimes I hear from providers are like, well, what? that doesn't make sense. Doesn't the person know that it would be better to stop drinking alcohol? They've got hep C or they've got, um, or why are they putting off treatment? Shouldn't they start now? And the important thing to remember is that sometimes patients are really not uh, processing it from a very logical perspective. They're just going with the gut. And I think that's just really important for us to remember. Um, as we wrap up here on the neurobiology, so addiction is gonna change brain circuits. It's gonna change the way in which people function. The non-addicted brain to the left, you see this big blue circle, that's the prefrontal cortex, that's the brain saying, stop, no, yeah, things may be good, drug, you know, using drugs, drinking a bunch of beer tonight might be good, but there are consequences. You're gonna be late for work tomorrow. You're gonna, you could crash your car if you're at happy hour. Don't do that. The addictive brain, however, reward that, that big red saliency uh, ball there, which is the nucleus accumbens, that need for feeling better, being driven by a larger memory. So you've got traumatic memories driving you to want to feel better. And then that control is kind of stunted. It's, you know, feeling better in the addictive brain. Feeling better is more important than the consequences that could come, which is why skipping a medication or injecting a drug or in engaging in risky sexual behaviors, all of those tend to be, and the consequences that come from that tend not to be factored into the equation. What's really being driven is how do I feel in the moment? How do I feel better in the moment? I need to feel better. And that's really important because that's why when people are ready in the moment, we have to be ready. We can't wait because we don't know how long that moment will last. So um, understand the biology and genetics and environmental factors related to addiction. Addiction. How do we provide care to people with infectious diseases who struggle with substance use disorders? And this is gonna be some of the really key things that, that we wanna talk about, right? So first of all, we know that we need to treat everyone with dignity and respect, right? People who use drugs are people. And that's why we actually use the terminology now, people who use drugs. Malingering, so manipulation, all of these are survival mechanisms for people who use drugs, right? please don't take it personally, right? Um, it's really important to remember this. I've had providers and staff who come in and they're so frustrated and they're frustrated because they were lied to and something else. And it's really important to remember, well, look, this person's trying to survive. You're in a position of power over them. You could wind up, you know, their urine tox could wind up getting them reincarcerated, their violation of parole. You could, uh, they could lose a job, they could get in trouble. They're afraid and they're trying to protect themselves. So that doesn't mean, you know, we have a big sign that says everyone come in lying, manipulation is free of charge, have at it. We have to hold patients accountable for their behaviors, but we shouldn't be surprised when people are behaving in a manner of survival, right? We need to find out where people are, treat them with dignity, respect, and help support them through the, the struggles of being sober and also getting treatment for their infectious diseases. All right, so here's some really practical, important steps. So one of the most important things is you should be screening all your patients, right? And that could be the simple screening questions I have here. How many times in the past year have you had five or more standard drinks in a day? How many times in the past year have you used an illegal drug or a prescription medication for non-medical use, right? If you can have patients, if your patients can read and write at a level that understands this and can fill it up themselves, that's great. If support staff can ask the question, that's great, but support staff may need training on how to ask these questions in a non-judgmental manner. And certainly if you as a provider are asking these questions, you have to ask it in a non-judgmental manner. How you ask a question will predict the response, right? If I say, well, how many times in the past year have you had five or more standard drinks in a day? Right, what's the answer? Absolutely none, never done it. I don't even know what alcohol is, right? Yeah, we have to ask in a supportive non-judgmental manner Otherwise, patients are gonna feel threatened and be unwilling to answer it honestly. Um, then another practical step is what about the system? Think about systems. So there's, we have to have low threshold, rapid access, appropriately dose treatment. Now that's a really packed statement, so let's unpack it. Low threshold means easy access, right? So it needs to be very simple for someone to get into treatment. Example, it used to take in uh, New Haven, six to eight weeks to get on to methadone maintenance. Now, that's a really long time for a substance user, right? Because it's saying, stay out of trouble with the law, 
don't overdose, don't get hospitalized and stay in contact with the program. Now, if you can do all of those things for six weeks, you probably don't need methadone, right? So what ended up happening? Well, I was seeing people in jail, I've seen people in the hospital because people couldn't make it. They couldn't make it. And so when we created a low threshold program, meaning that people coming in could get access to treatment the day that they asked for it, what happened? Treatment exploded. All of a sudden people started getting treatment who had never had access to treatment before, right? So low threshold, it's gotta be easy to get in the door, but rapid access. It doesn't do you any good if you got an appointment today, but treatment starts next week. You got to get the appointment today, but treatment's got to start today because today is when the patient's interested. And appropriately dosed is really important because if all you do is start people on treatment and you just leave it at a low dose, then what winds up happening is it's ineffective, right? So an example here is uh, when we we're in Tanzania working on a methadone maintenance program, staff were very concerned about overdosing patients. It was partly because we didn't know the purity of the heroin being trafficked through. We didn't know the tolerance of individuals and the metabolic process of methadone is complicated. And so we weren't sure how it would be metabolized in East Africans. And so it was all low dose. People are getting 25, 30 milligrams of, of methadone, which was clearly inadequate. People kept injecting and people wondered, well, what's the problem? And so I challenged folks to say, well, look, start raising doses and see what happens. And as they raised the doses, not surprisingly, what happened is people stopped using heroin. And that's fantastic. And that team quickly saw that data and then they expanded it. And they did a fantastic job of implementing low threshold, rapid access, appropriate dose treatment. The next thing that's really important is culturally appropriate counseling for addiction. And that can be super simple. Not that the 12 steps are simple, but it, 12 steps are everywhere. It can be more complicated like cognitive behavioral therapy. There isn't any solid data to say one counseling modality far outshines another. What we do know is that there is absolutely no evidence that you should wait for counseling before starting treatment. And this has been studied time and again, but people who started methadone, for example, and then had delayed counseling because it wasn't available for weeks, they had the same outcomes as people who started counseling as soon as they got in the door, right? So what is the point? The point is, Counseling is appropriate, uh, excuse me, counseling is important. It should be culturally appropriate, but it should not hold up the admission process. And then lastly, some very practical steps. We have to treat everybody. We have to provide naloxone for overdose prevention. We have to do that for the patients themselves and for their significant others. We need to be treating comorbid uh, infectious diseases. So HIV, hepatitis B and C, and TB if you're in an area of the world where TB is an issue. And how are we gonna do that? One critical thing here is this trans theoretical model of change. And we don't have a lot of time to talk about it, but the most important thing is understanding that not everybody wants to start treatment. When that happens, you meet them where they are. Maybe they need a clean syringe to avoid getting hep C or to avoid sharing hep C. Maybe they need naloxone and Maybe what we need to do is realize that that person's what we call is pre-contemplative, they're in denial. And so one of the things that's really important is helping people along the stages of change. When someone comes in and they think they don't have a problem, getting into an argument with them is ineffective. They just aren't in a cognitive place to believe that there's a problem. So what do you do in that situation? If you have external evidence, you bring that in. So, you know, you lost your job, your family left you, you've lost your housing, your parole officer is threatening to incarcerate you, bringing in external evidence to say, help me understand what's going on here. There are these other things in your life and all of these other people are saying there's a problem. What, you know, can you comment on that? And oftentimes patients just are in denial, they're not gonna be there, but bringing back evidence each time you see the person can be a way to help move the person from pre-contemplative to contemplative, right? Out of denial, to the openness of maybe needing help. All right, so how do we think about methadone? Amanda's a 30 year old woman. She comes into your clinic and after much creative and interesting conversation, you conclude that the oxycodone you were giving her for back pain is not in the urine toxicology, but morphine is. So what do you do? Well, you could refuse to refill the medication and call someone else to deal with the patient. You could agree with the patient that was a one-time thing and give all or some of the oxycodone. 
You could discuss treatment for opioids and start buprenorphine. You could discuss treatment for opioids and refer to methadone. You could discuss treatment for opioids and start naltrexone. What do you guys want to do? All right, let's see what folks are thinking. All right, so we got a fair number of people who are thinking about starting buprenorphine and starting methadone. So let's let's start some more, talk some more about that. All right, so this is what her life would look like on heroin, All right? So you've got these little tick marks, which are heroin use. And early in the course of substance use, the person is gets high, they feel euphoric, right? And then as time goes on, they've developed tolerance. And so use really just means that they're trying to feel normal. And then further along, oftentimes they're trying to get back to this euphoria and that's when people can overdose and die, right? And this is just a graphic from 1966. This is from the early days of mapping out heroin life cycles. So when we think about what we would wanna do with Amanda, right? We've got three options and we have to think about what do we think is the best thing for her? Well, first of all, if we think about methadone, methadone is efficacious, just as buprenorphine and naltrexone, but it has the best retention, right? It can start at any time. The big caveat is you have to refer someone to an opioid treatment program. That's what OTP stands for. So if Amanda comes in and she's recently used heroin or she's like just used heroin, sending her to a methadone program, if that methadone program can admit her today, might be the right way to go because they could give her methadone on top of the heroin that she did today. Buprenorphine is efficacious. Its retention is less than uh, methadone. And that's light, largely thought to be caused because it has mild withdrawal. It can be done in primary care settings. One of the issues is that because it's a partial opioid agonist is it dislodges the heroin from the mu opioid receptor. So if Amanda did heroin today, we're gonna to have to wait for her to go into mild withdrawal before we can give her buprenorphine. And some patients are more than willing to do that, some patients not. And that would be one of the big deciding factors for me thinking about methadone or buprenorphine today. For naltrexone, you can't have opioids for seven days. It's a pure antagonist. Retention is less than methadone, and bu methadone or buprenorphine. It can be done in primary care settings, but we wouldn't be able to do it with Amanda today because her urine tox is positive for morphine. So when we think about methadone, I think one of the ways to think about it is what are the goods that it does? It reduces injection, it in decreases psychosocial and medical morbidity, it helps increase access to and retention with HIV therapy and improves health status and helps keep people out of uh, prison, which is all, all good stuff. When we think about buprenorphine, it's really easier than HIV care, right? Think of all of the different classes of medications, all of the things that are coming down the pipeline. Buprenorphine is very simple. The patient comes in a mild to moderate withdrawal, it started on four milligrams sublingually and titrated up. And you always, always have to educate the patients on the sublingual uh, dosing, which is really important. And then we connect them to counseling, which could be Narcotics Anonymous, CBT, or any number of things. And then we monitor treatment, right? It's, it's super easy, super easy. How does it work in the brain? You can see really simply, top here is an MRI. This is the PET scan. PET scan is looking at mu opioid receptor availability. So you can see when first someone has no buprenorphine, zero, there are these groups that red there is the nucleus accumbens, that pleasure response area, not surprising, it's covered in opiate receptors. And so you can see that at zero buprenorphine, the brain's open for business for opioids. As you give buprenorphine, and this would be true in methadone as well, it's just not as dramatic, you see lots of those receptors fill up and that nucleus accumbens area is completely getting dark almost there. What does that mean? The way I explain it to patients, is you've got a parking lot in your brain. We fill up the parking lot with buprenorphine cars. So the heroin cars have no place to park and the person is unable to get high, right? So uh, whether it's methadone or buprenorphine, days on treatment would look like this. You take the medication, you feel normal. If you use H, that's here, the heroin, what do you do? Well, it's in your system, but it's being blocked and it's not causing the euphoria. And that's really important because one of the things that's important for behavior change is, you know, when people start on treatment, they tend to continue to cycle with drug use for a while because it's a habit. It is ingrained in the way they're thinking. It's how they cope with things. And it's not a habit that's broken easily. If it was broken easily, then they would have stopped long ago. 
We've talked about retention a lot, uh, and this is really important just to remember that when we think about retention of buprenorphine versus methadone, there was a study a while ago, and it was looking, it was the primary outcome measure of the study was looking at liver enzyme changes in people with hepatitis C who are randomized to methadone and buprenorphine. This was the original study that was required by the FDA to find out if buprenorphine could hurt the liver, which was based off of some case studies in France. And so one of the things that was found is that um, buprenorphine patients were dropping out at a much higher rate than methadone patients. And as you can see, right, they had to ra ultimately randomize 740 people to buprenorphine to get 340 to complete. They were randomizing two to one because of this high dropout rate. So both buprenorphine and methadone resulted in significant reductions in HIV risk behaviors. If you took the medication, it made a difference. The big, and I think one of the really important implications for this was methadone kept people in treatment longer. Why is that important? Well, it's super important when you think about needing to stabilize our patients' lives that are really chaotic or helping patients complete, say, you know, 12 weeks of a hepatitis C treatment or um, longer times with HIV therapy or to address chemotherapy or cancers. So it's really important to get people to access to treatment, but it's also really important to understand the limitations. And so if a patient started on buprenorphine and that patient drops out of treatment, don't blame the patient necessarily. Really think, okay, maybe this wasn't the right medication for the patient. Just like switching from one HIV therapy to another, you may say, oh, it wasn't the right you know, medication. It had a side effect or some problem and I needed to change the patient over. So just because you don't do well on buprenorphine doesn't mean you won't excel in methadone. This is an important uh, slide from many, many years ago. And it's really important because if you see down at the bottom, there's this rising problem of pink. These are new HIV cases among people who are injecting drugs. And up here you see in red and blue criminal arrests. So people are using heroin and that's pretty constant over until like 2009. And then you have this whole methamphetamine and stimulant use, right? And one of the things that you see is starting in 2006, there is this rapid escalation, right? And this rapid escalation is the number of people who are being put into methadone maintenance in Taiwan, right? Now, why is that important? Well, what that's telling you is that uh, harm reduction services, syringe exchange, education, getting people in treatment, it's actually making a difference. And I think the thing that's fascinating is it's not as though although you see some small decrease in use, there's still a huge number of people that continue to use, but HIV rates drop down dramatically, right? If we can take out of circulation individuals who are traveling with infectious diseases and transmitting those diseases, then we're actually able to stop epidemics, right? And it's one of the reasons that we wanna see everyone with HIV treated with HIV therapy, whether they're actively using or not. And that's why we wanna see everybody who's willing to take hep C treatment to be offered that treatment and to be supported through successfully getting treated. And why is that? We wanna do that because it's so important that we help re reduce the burden of disease and the number of you know, virions in a sense in circulation because hepatitis C is very, very infectious and it's very easy for it to grow very quickly. And so we've gotta stop it everywhere we can. And here's an example of how rapidly scaling up access to treatment and rapidly starting an initiative that's harm reduction based can make a huge impact. So what are some of the key points on substance use and HIV? Well, one thing, ongoing substance use is not a contradiction, excuse me, to HIV therapy. ART reduces the risk of HIV transmission to sexual and drug using partners. So if the person meets criteria for getting HIV therapy, which is that they have HIV, they should not be denied it, even if they're actively using drugs. The selection of ART among individuals who use substances should account for a potential adherence barrier, right? So if you're asking somebody to take multiple pills and multiple times a day, that's gonna be much more difficult than a one pill once a day. I have to think about the comorbidities which could impact care. What well, does the person have advanced liver disease? Are there other things that we need to be concerned about? Are there drug interactions that we should be concerned about? Um, you know, is, is this something that's gonna impact methadone or buprenorphine? Are there possible adverse events associated with the medications, right? Is there some kind of crossover uh, in the way in which the drugs are perceived, right? So if 
If you start an HIV therapy, for example, that causes nausea, well, one of the signs of opioid, opioid withdrawal is nausea. So if you don't upfront tell the patient and the person starts taking a pill and starts getting some nausea, that person may say, whoa, this is, this is eating my methadone or my buprenorphine. I'm going to stop taking the pills. And that is really important to be thinking about these different aspects because you want the patient to be successful and the patient wants to be successful. When we think about uh, HIV, or excuse me, substance use in hep C, it's incredibly prevalent, right? Um, to, to the point that, you know, if we meet somebody with HIV um, who uh, injects drugs, right? That person's gonna have hep C. They probably got the hep C first, right? So it's really important for us to just realize that our patients, and hopefully most of your patients have already been treated for hepatitis C. We know that HIV increases progression to end-stage liver disease among hep C infected patients. We wanna make sure that everybody gets treated. We want to obviously discourage alcohol use, but alcohol use is not anything that should prevent a person from getting treated. Um, I remember years ago seeing a patient who was actively using drugs. He was an older gentleman. He was like, I'm, I'm not gonna stop doing drugs, but you know, I want my hep C treated. And so I sat down with him and I said, I'm willing to treat your hepatitis C. You know, the, the big thing that we have to figure out is how are you going to take this medication once a day at the same time every day? Because that's the only way it's going to work. And, you know, if, if you're wanting to take it, you want it to be successful, it would really suck if you started taking it and then forgot and then like, or you started, you took most of it and then you forgot. Like that would really be a bummer. You want, you want to be successful. So interestingly enough, you know, in the conversation, you know, he was committed to doing it. We got him set up, we got him the meds. And then a couple of weeks later, his uh, counselor calls me and is like, what, what happened? Like, what did you do to this guy? I was like, all right, I don't know. That sounds bad. She's like, well, no, it's not bad. He actually stopped doing all drugs, alcohol, and he even quit smoking because he was so worried about not remembering to take his hep C meds. And so it's so interesting. I'm not saying treating hep C will become the magic bullet that has everyone become sober, but it was really fascinating, right? He was so adamant about not stopping I told him, it's not a bim, you can keep using if you want, but you just got to remember. And that motivation, the remembering, I want to be successful. They're giving me this chance to do hep C treatment. I'll stop anything that could get in my way of being successful, right? So never underestimate how patients can be successful. Here's a guy who nobody could ever thought would have stopped using or would have been successful. And he both stopped using and um, was cured of hepatitis C. So, what do we say? If you can take the medication, you can be cured. Yes, even if you're still doing drugs and alcohol. We've had patients who've continued to use throughout the process, but if they take their medications, they get clear. Um, I'm sure most everyone knows about the hccvguidelines.org, which is a fantastic reference for hep C treatment and continues to be updated. One of the practical problems that folks often ask me about are urine drug testing. What happens if it's positive for illicit drugs? Well, you know, one of the things is that it could be relapse, obviously. It could be self-medication of pain, right? So that could be relapse due to stressors we talked about. You know, one of the things that's super important is to be asking people what's going on, what happened, right? And if you have a trusting relationship with patients, oftentimes they'll be forthcoming. Um, ongoing treatment might be contingent on entering addiction treatment services. So if you're getting pain medication and you relapse to cocaine, and you're taking the pain medication, right? If you're not taking pain meds and you're just selling them, we're not gonna give you any more pain meds. But if you're taking the medication, right? We might say, okay, look, you know what? I need you to get in, uh, enroll in some treatment for this cocaine use. I'm gonna give you enough meds to your intake appointment. And then if you go to your intake appointment, great. Then I'll basically give you meds from your therapy appointment to your therapy appointment or things like that. That's called contingency management. And that's a way in which to increase a person's engagement with the outcome that's desired. What if it's positive for other prescribed drugs? So it could be a false positive. It's again, important to talk with the lab that does your urine toxicology to make sure that you know what the test can and cannot do. Uh, we had a problem years ago where a generic sertraline kept causing our instant uh, drug testing cups to test positive for benzodiazepines. And then when we sent them off for confirmation testing, we would find that it was a false positive. Uh, again, positive for other prescribed drugs could be self-medication of undertreated pain. And obviously, if you're negative for the prescribed substance, one of the big questions is, when did you last take that medication? One of the things I would always do in pain clinic is I'm always asking patients, when did you last take the pain medicine? And I'm writing that in the chart. 
I'm doing that because I'm going to get sometimes the urine toxicology back days later. And so if I call the patient or I address the urine tox at the next visit, I need to know what did the patient tell me on the day that they did the test? Because if I ask them a month later, hey, did you run out of meds early? The patient would obviously say, oh yeah, yeah, I forgot to tell you, right? So it's important to have documented that prior so that you can then bring it up to the patient. Because in that situation, I'm able to say to the patient, you know, you told me that you took the meds every day the week before we did the urine test, but the urine test doesn't have the drugs in it. So it's not possible that you took the pills every day, right? Like, I can't, I can't reconcile these. Help me understand what's going on. And then a consequence so could that be, well, I'm gonna redo the urine toxicology for you today. I'm gonna to bring you back in a, you know, next week, you're getting a shorter supply of medications. It might be we're starting a taper. It could be any number of things. And obviously one thing at the bottom of the slide to remember is medication diversion. It happens, it's important to have it on your radar. When we're addressing mental health, right? So one thing that's important is a baseline mental health evaluations for every HIV patient that has chronic pain or substance use disorders. There's a high prevalence of mental health disorders in HIV and mental health disorders can complicate pain and pain treatment. This is why we encourage screening for everyone. A particular concern again is uh, violence when trauma, mood disorders, recent grief or loss, again, stressors are hugely important. And then it's always important to be thoughtful about a history of suicidal ideation as patients can become depressed and suicidal. Pain and addiction are overlapping, but as we mentioned earlier, it's a distinct disorder when we were talking about methamphetamine use and we were talking about um, the opioids. Um, it's important for us to remember that uh, somebody could be using cocaine or methamphetamines and have an addiction problem it be on methadone or another opioid for pain. Um, we know that we don't just stop a diabetes medicine if you're not taking your antihypertensives, right? And we have to really think about pain and addiction as two separate disorders like diabetes and hypertension. And in our systems, we always say, if you, know, if you have an active drug addiction problem, I'm not gonna kick you to the curb, but just like I might have to have you come back to the clinic more often to monitor your blood pressure, you're coming back more often, I need you to engage in addiction treatment and we need to better supervise the opioids that you have access to. So as we think about uh, this complex topic of substance use, HIV, hepatitis C, and as we think about the services that we need to provide and the approach to the patients, it's really important that we remember that if we organize the care for substance users with infectious diseases and we organize them in a way that's easily accessible to the patients, right? They're going to accept that. They'll participate in their care services, but it's got to be with them in mind and where possible, have them participate in that decision-making. Ask your patients, what works? What doesn't work? What do you like? What don't you like? What other services do you think you need? You know, substance users are very keen on what their needs are. And if you ask them and you work with them, they will help you design and implement something that's really meaningful, both to you as a provider, because you'll be able to help participate in the recovery process of your patients. Um, it's really important just also to remember that people will take their medications. So um, just because we may be afraid, oh, you know, I don't know if Johnny's gonna take all of his meds or I don't know, if, maybe that becomes the honest conversation. And we've, I've done that with patients where I've said, look, we're both worried that you're gonna to forget to take these pills. What's the best process? Is it you're coming into methadone clinic every day for your methadone? Do we have the hep C meds here for you? Or do we get you a visiting nurse? Or what do we do, right? Um, patients just like, you know, substance users just like everybody else can really benefit from support and an on honest conversation about how are you gonna be successful? How are you gonna to win today? You wanna to win, the patient wants to win and be cured of hepatitis C. And so a really important thing is partnering with the patient to figure out the best way forward. And then lastly, you know, innovative, innovative ways to bring treatment to people who use drugs remains a critical public health concern, right? It, it really is going to require continued novelty. Um, just because an integrated treatment program works in New Haven or in Boston or New York, San Francisco or anywhere else in the country or the world, right? It doesn't mean that it's this out of the box, easy package that you deliver, right? You have to meet with your patients. You have to think about your own situations. What are the drugs that are being used? What's the accessibility to HIV and hep C therapy? What's the availability of counseling? What are all of the resources that you have available? And then work as an interdisciplinary team to really think about what's the best way forward. 
but be innovative, be creative because your patients are counting on you. Substance users can be successful with HIV care, with hepatitis C care, and it's really on all of us as healthcare providers, as individuals who are really committed to the care of people with HIV and hepatitis C and substance use to think about novel solutions. And then I would encourage you as you come up with those novel solutions, as you work with people and see these successes, make it known, write about it, communicate it, talk about it, talk about it in your local community, talk about it nationally, because people need to hear it. People need to be continue to be encouraged and reminded that substance users, like people who use drugs are people and they can be successful in the treatment of infectious diseases. Thank you all very much for getting through the, next, the last whirlwind hour with me. We are now returning to our, where, where our pre-test questions are now our post-test questions. And they are, which medication has the best retention and treatment for people with an opioid use disorder? Buprenorphine, methadone, naltrexone, A and C, B and C, they're all the same. Hoping we're gonna get a good response here on the survey says. Fantastic, methadone it is. All right, and our next question. How long should a person with an opioid use disorder be sober prior to starting hepatitis C treatment? Zero months, three months, six months, nine months, or 12 months? All right, and survey says. Fantastic, excellent, zero months, that's right. If somebody is eligible for treatment, wants to come in and is treatable, the length of sobriety should never be an obstacle. All right. Fantastic. All right. And now we've got some time to do some Q&A. So please submit some questions using the Q&A button and we will try to address those. Thank you all again. So one, uh, so we got two questions right now. Is there a good resource for causes of false positive urine drug screens? And that's a great question. Um, there really aren't a lot of good repositories for that. If you reach out to your urine toxicology company, they should be able to provide you with concrete data. Oftentimes they'll have a list. So for example, Quest Diagnostics has uh, urine toxicology uh, experts, and you can get a list from them of what the false positives and false negative risks are and what can cross-react. Another question, what ART interacts with methadone and buprenorphine? Great question. So the there's actually a couple reviews on that. If you email me at robert.bruce at bmc.org, I can send you the manuscripts. But uh, in short, buprenorphine does not significantly interact with any HIV therapy except maybe atazanavir, but certainly most people are integrase inhibitors these days and there's no interaction there. Methadone interacts with the old NNRTIs, efavirenz and nevirapine, uh, but does not interact with any of the integrase inhibitors. Um, one question, will this, oh. Someone was asking if it's being recorded and the answer is absolutely yes. Other questions? I wanna encourage people not to prejudge their patients. You never know when someone's going to actually agree to treatment and be successful. Um, some of the nearest and dearest patients of mine have been people that you know, no one ever thought would either start substance use treatment or be successful in it. Um, someone's asking if I would share the slides. Absolutely, I think they're all gonna be posted as part of this webinar. Um, another question, any differences with rural treatment? Patients in my former area had to drive 200 miles away to get methadone treatment. 
Diane, I am sorry to hear that. That is absolutely tragic and a real issue in many parts of the country. And honestly, this is one of the big reasons that the utilization of buprenorphine and naltrexone has been something that uh, everyone's trying to push more and more because it's really critical that people have access to these medications. Um, so one of the things that you can do, if, if methadone is the better medication for those patients, you might be able to work with the methadone program. SAMHSA has a system that allows for uh, what are called exceptions to the rule. And so uh, distance traveled might be an acceptable uh, exception so that the patient might only have to go to the program once a week or every other week to obtain bottles. Uh, ideally, the person should be sober and in good standing with that program. Um, but certainly there are options that are available if methadone is the medication the patient's being successful with. Otherwise, buprenorphine or naltrexone would be uh, other options. Buprenorphine has better retention than naltrexone, so I would, I would go with buprenorphine first. Other questions? Um, ask, uh, one question is, do you use a bup alone? And so I think, uh, I assume the question is, are you using buprenorphine or buprenorphine in combination with the naltrexone? So uh, we typically use the buprenorphine in combination with naltrexone largely because it, or excuse me, yeah, with naltrexone, naloxone, because it is um, cheaper. So the bup in combination with naloxone is, uh, has certainly been cheaper in many of the places we practice. So we've gone with cost. The naloxone was combined, combined with buprenorphine in the concern, again, this is another uh, French study where people were injecting buprenorphine. And there are people that inject buprenorphine globally. We did a case series of individuals in Malaysia. Um, people tend to do that actually because it's a little complicated, but buprenorphine has a high first pass hepatic metabolism. And so that's why it's sublingual dosing. You're trying to bypass the liver. Injection is another way to bypass the liver. So if you're, you know, a substance user in Malaysia, you might say, well, I want to, I need, I'm using buprenorphine as maintenance therapy, but the pills are really expensive. And so I need the smallest possible dose, which is what I can afford to take medication every day. And so what we found in Malaysia was actually a group of people injecting buprenorphine as a cheap form of maintenance. So Long and the short of it is naloxone makes people feel rotten if they inject it with the buprenorphine. It does not cause people to stop injecting to in total. So one question, why is naltrexone not used as often as the other treatments? I think there are two big reasons. Uh, number one is you have to be off the opioids for at least a week before you can take the, the naltrexone. So, uh, where it's been used most successfully, and Sandy Springer from Yale has done some really nice work on this in uh, prison systems. So individuals who had a, in, were incarcerated, so they're not using opioids in the prison system and given a depot formulation of naltrexone prior to discharge. And so those individuals actually are able to start naltrexone and they're able to leave the prison system and they've been able to continue taking medication uh, and stay sober for months on end. So there are gonna be populations where it works really well. Uh, a controlled population like in the prison system is very uh, different than you know, our clinic system, for example, where people come in off the street using. And so it just becomes very difficult to ask a patient to wait a week. So that's number one. Uh, number two is it's an antagonist. And so what that means is it doesn't have a positive neurobiological reward like methadone or buprenorphine, which are both opioids. And so what ends up happening is people don't get this positive uh, reinforcement from taking it neurobiologically. And so uh, the dropout rates are higher. So I think those are the two, two main reasons. There's also a big cost issue. Uh, one of the reasons we weren't using buprenorphine and naltrexone internationally um, was because methadone is the cheapest uh, medication with the best retention. Another question, uh, someone has an elderly patient, seven years old on Bictarvi, high dose of buprenorphine, opiate positive on the most recent UA with confirmation, uh, buprenorphine and norbub confirmed. So it's a, it's a good question. The person's taking eight milligrams of 
buprenorphine naloxone three times a day. And the really question was, is about the person is using buprenorphine and had a urine toxicology that was positive. So kind of what, what could be going on here? Well, there are a lot of possibilities. So um, number one is that individuals who have an opiate in their urine tox, right? They've consumed something like heroin, morphine, or something like that that's causing it to be opiate positive. And so um, that's, that's a real concern, right? Um, now, why is it? Is it again stress? Is it again um, just had a fun weekend? You know, even though the person's 70, we have people who are actively using. So, a big question is what did you use and why did you use it? Right? Is this a one time thing or is this a repeated thing? Another important question is do, does the patient really need three eight milligram tablets? Now, I'll tell you, in our practice, we actually get really anxious when people are trying to push their dose up higher. And we usually think people are pushing their dose higher, number one, because they're not taking it sublingually, right? So what I find is that patients will put a pill under their, in their mouth, they chew it, they suck on it, they swallow it quickly. And 90% of it is destroyed by the liver if you just swallow it, right? So I mean, that's, that's if you took 100 milligrams of buprenorphine and just swallowed it, you got 10 milligrams worth of it in your blood, right? So it's astronomical, right? So the first thing that we do in those patients is we have them come in and we just see how they actually take the pill. And that's really important. So assuming that the person is really taking it properly, um, usually they don't need eight milligrams three times a day, unless they're really large people have a large volume of distribution. So that's number one. Number two, one of the big reasons people are wanting three times a day, right, is number one, I'm not absorbing enough. Number two is diversion. There's a huge diversion market for buprenorphine. So in situations like this, what we would do is we would say, okay, you have an opiate positive urine toxicology. Uh, we're very concerned that this opiate urine toxicology is a relapse to heroin. Patient says it's a one-time thing or it's a false positive or whatever. Well, I'm sorry, um, but it's there, right? You know, we'll send it off for confirmation or not. If it, we send it off for confirmation and it's, it's heroin, we're gonna have to address that. Well, how do we address that? Well, one of the ways we can address that is by saying, I'm concerned that you're getting too much buprenorphine, right? One of the ways you can do that is if you're sending out confirmations routinely, if you see high levels of the buprenorphine or norbup on GC mass spec, right? Uh, you, you should only look at trends, right? So if the person, it's very hard to interpret sometimes, but if the person's always at like 3000 nanograms and then one day they're like at 30, you're gonna say, that's really weird. Maybe they were taking all of their medication before and now they're not taking as much, right? So that's also something to factor in. If I see a drop like that, I may say to the patient, I'm gonna give you two Suboxone. I'm not giving you three. We're gonna see you next week. We're gonna monitor this closely, right? So there are a lot of different ways to do it, but it's important to confront the behavior, have an honest conversation about it, address the possible um, dosing issue, which is just not taking it sublingually appropriately. But there's also the big concern about diversion and misuse. What's the average Suboxone dose for most patients? Everyone absolutely wants more. So in our practice, um, we're looking at 12 to 16 milligrams as kind of the middle of the bell curve. They're gonna be people on less and people on more. People who get more, we tend to have uh, greater supervision. So that may be more frequent urine toxins, callbacks to check pills or other things. Um, we just worry that one of the things that happens is, and this always happens in buprenorphine patients, is they realize they don't have to take the medication every day because what ends up happening is you miss a dose, you're delayed a dose. If that happens with heroin, you start getting sick. When you miss it with buprenorphine, you realize, ah, huh, maybe I don't need all that. And so people will start to stockpile and partly people stockpile just like you would have done with heroin. You're trying to make sure you have a stash in case something happens. But then when you find out that you can make 10 to 15 bucks a pill, you get tempted by the economics of that. So, um, 12 to 16 is our average. People who want more, we have more supervision. Um, and then I'm, last question here, what's the email address to request the manuscripts on ART interactions and MAT use? It's robert, R-O-B-E-R-T dot Bruce, B-R-U-C-E at B-M-C dot O-R-G.
Well, thank you all very much for your time and your great questions and being such a wonderfully interactive audience in the world of Zoom. Thank you, Dr. Bruce. Evaluations and how to claim continuing education credits will be emailed by tomorrow, 5 p.m. Pacific time. Access our newly updated 2020 ISUSA ARV guidelines in the following link. Information will also be available on the ISUSA website. We have a upcoming course this Thursday, November 12th. For more information, please visit isusa.org. Additionally, we have two upcoming webinars. The next one will be part four of the series on pain and addiction. For more information and how to register, please visit our website. And we have an upcoming dialogue on COVID-19 on November 23rd. This concludes today's webinar presentation.